Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my third ever Hometown Heroes podcast with your host, Thomas Vallot. Today, we have a very special guest, Mrs. Sarah Hadley, Executive Director of Home Health and Hospice at Ohio Living. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Thomas. I'm happy to be here. Would you tell us a little bit about what you do at Ohio Living? Sure. Um, Ohio Living is a nonprofit, um, faith-based organization. We're one of the larger um, uh, organizations in the nation, and um, we're comprised of 12 um, uh, communities across, life plan communities across Ohio. Um, Those are also like retirement homes. So you might be familiar with Lake Vista in Cortland. Um, And then we also have our home health and hospice programs. And my job is to run um, our home health and hospice programs that are in Mahoney Valley. I have about eight counties that I oversee and our senior center that's in Youngstown and also my independence program that works on the Lake Vista campus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, So with that, the first question I have is, you know, nursing homes is being, you know, one of the I don't want to say hard hit areas, but, you know, an area that could be especially, uh, you know, easy for the virus to get in. So, you know, what would you say that what what would a challenge be that you guys have faced with that? Sure. So um, every day we have a lot of calls with our different executive directors at our different nursing homes. So in talking with them and our different um providers in the different counties that we serve, what I will tell you, I hear from them, um, is number one is the protection of our most vulnerable population. That's their first concern. Um, But aside from that, it's making sure that you can keep your daily operations going while, while protecting them, but also worrying about all that social isolation that they have right now. They can't see their families um, and it's just a difficult time for everybody so it's really that combination of everything um, that's going on and and it's hard uh, for the people who are are making those decisions and running it um, because they know that they have to keep them safe Um, it's not an easy decision um, but they also have to be very inventive right now um, to help with that isolation right yeah so you know in your field of work, you know, what would you say is the biggest challenge you face, you know, not in these hard times too, but, you know, on a regular basis? Um, gosh, there's a lot. Um, I would say right now um, it's probably twofold. Um, one is for me, I would say is I have my staff out there working in it. So every night I'm not sleeping well because I'm, I'm nervous and I'm scared about my own workforce and my, my team. Um, who are working alongside it. Um, So that's been very hard. Um, I think the other thing is um, our our, uh, residents, our patients, um, making sure that everybody is safe, um, that the community is educated and um, doing the right things and thinking about other people, not just themselves and all the decisions they make. Um, But we have found also that it's not even about the direct care. Um, Things have gone a lot further. The isolation that we see in the community is bigger. We have people who um, don't just need physical needs. They are shut in from their churches. They need prayer. They need phone calls. Um, They can't get their groceries. Um, So we developed a task force, a wellness task force, and we have people simply calling um, people in the community and finding out if they just need to talk to somebody over the phone, um, if they need groceries delivered. We found a gentleman who did not even have a refrigerator in his home. And so we had somebody, um, we got some donations, we had our staff go buy the refrigerator and deliver groceries. And those are the things that um, as people cannot get out, people cannot communicate to each other, we're finding are real. And so I think it's a lot bigger than just uh, a virus right now. Right. That's wonderful that you guys got, you know, that man, that, that, that refrigerator. And, you know, that's sad that, you know, he didn't have one, but um, you know, so things like that, how, you know, how difficult is it for these people right now? You know, are they, are they shut off from, you know, all, you know, family seeing them, you know, how hard would you, would you say it's, for them and you know how hard has it hit them really 
I, well, I think um, it definitely is difficult, but I will tell you for us, we're doing a lot of things uh, virtual. Um, we very quickly, um, you know, we're lucky as being such a large company. Our IT department was uh, wonderful. So we started virtual visits very, very quickly. Um, our home health um, and our hospice team really came online quickly with that. Um, we also started um, uh, telehealth with our doctors quickly. So those things helped immensely. Same thing within the nursing home structure. I think one of our campuses already has done over a thousand virtual visits uh, with family members. It's one of our larger ones. Um, but again, that takes a lot of time and effort from staff to be able to get those iPods and iPads and, and you name it in, in the hands of the residents. So um, there's a lot of things like that. I know one of our buildings had a resident at the door and um, I think it was a grandson playing tic-tac-toe between the glass. So, um, you know, it's coming up with all of those different ideas. Um, and, you know, even partnerships with schools. We just partnered with JFK and um, they've been writing letters. And what started out with just you guys writing letters to Lake Vista, we decided to send those and the students have actually been reaching all 12 of our campuses. And so all the residents get those letters. Um, then we took it further and we said, let's give them to all the home health and hospice patients. And so, um, you know, annually we serve about 73,000 people. Um, and so we just decided let's get them in the hands of as many people as we can and let them know that these kids are thinking and praying and um, thinking about somebody more than just themselves right now. And so you guys have even um, been reaching more than I think you realize and have just been an absolute godsend. And so it's connecting people and um, helping in ways like that right um you know so what would you say you know makes for a good nursing home um what i would say first and foremost is they need to be there to serve and um and serve the the people who are there so that means all of their residents and all of their staff and so when they have a heart to serve that means they're excellent and I think the other thing is that they have integrity and they focus on quality. And I think when you have those things, you have an excellent nursing home. Right. Uh, you know, what, what would you say separates your nursing home and assisted living from, you know, say others in Ohio? I'm partial to Ohio living, but I think that there's excellence everywhere. I think that that stigma of uh, nursing homes has really changed and but I think what I love about nursing home or our nursing homes and in Ohio living um, home health and hospice and is our mission and at the end of our mission statement it is that we do things according to the Christian gospel and so we're a nonprofit we're here to serve and I think that that's what um, I love about us is that um, we have that heart of service and um, be, that's what drives our decisions. And so that's why I work there. Um, and that's what the difference I think is with us. Right. Yeah. I think that inspires, it definitely inspires me and, I, and I'm sure your workers, you know, I've been around some of your workers and I know that they live that out every day and, you know, in their work and mm -hmm. they spread it to those, the patients and the people that live there. So thank you. You know, I know you talked about them briefly, but you know, what changes have, you know, been made uh, during this time uh, when COVID-19 has, you know, faced the nursing home? Gosh. Um, so not only just the nursing home, home health, hospice. So um, every employee before they start their work day. So um, if you're going into the nursing home, if you're actually going to start home health or in hospice, every employee has to go through a health screen. And there's a series of questions that they have to make sure they have to take their temperature before they can start their work day. Um, there in the nursing home, there's going to be checkpoints um, to where you're only allowed to have access into the building now through certain doors. Um, some nursing homes are really going to only let it, people come in and out one door. Um, and that's where a lot of that screening process takes place. Um, 
Also in home health or hospice, if someone's coming into the home, there's going to be screening um, questions that are asked of that family or that home before they even enter. Um, and based on the um, answers are going to be the different types of PPE that that staff would wear before they actually even step foot into the home. Um, if um, you are in the nursing home, what you're going to find is there's a lot of differences in terms of um, the residents congregating. So you're not going to see that um, anymore. So they're not going to go down to the dining hall and all eat together. Those meals and trays are going to be delivered to their rooms. They're going to keep them more isolated. Um, all of those things take a lot more creativity, takes a lot more staff to be able to be able to handle all of that um, throughout the day. Um, and so that puts a lot of burden on all of our area um, nursing homes to be able to do that um, and make sure everybody's safe and healthy. Um, again, the cleaning, the sanitizing um, is done frequently. Um, and again, more uh, task within the nursing homes and even the home health offices and things like that. Um, uh, you're gonna see more creativity uh, virtual visits, telehealth, teledoctors, all of those things coming into play. Um, face masks, um, the staff in the facilities wearing face masks. And that makes it hard because you can't see me smiling behind a face mask. And, you know, when you're, when I'm taking care of you every day, um, some things that help you during your day are to see me smiling at you. And so those are some of the little things that we take for granted to keep people um, healthy and safe and happy, but you know, you're not going to see me smiling behind a face mask, but it's important for that protection of our um, elderly. And so um, the other thing too, is you'll see that um, people who come back into care, so they've left the hospital or they've come um, from another area are going to be somewhat quarantined for about 14 days, even if they're not symptomatic. And that's just to protect the rest of the population. So, um, and also to protect the workforce. And um, so there's a lot of different measures that are happening um, and it's all just to keep everybody safe. Um, and, I, and I hope that that gives a lot of reassurance to everybody out there um, that all the nursing homes are, are really doing their due diligence. Right. And I know you talked about a little bit about how you guys established a task force. Um, you know, how effective and, you know, how big has that been in, you know, keeping those, you know, measures and safety in place? Um, I think it's really been um, one of the most important things. I think sometimes in healthcare, we only want to think of the physical. But if we don't focus on the psychosocial and the spiritual, um, we're really not doing a great job. It really needs to be holistic care. And so um, I could have my nurses and therapists go out there every day, but if we're not connecting and getting that um, spiritual piece to those um, people in need, um, there's going to be a missing piece. They're going to become depressed. Um, we're seeing that there's a lot of that happening, a lot of anxiety. So my social workers are offering a lot of counseling over the phone. The other thing that we also changed um, recently was our bereavement program. Um, we saw that our widows and widowers needed a lot more help and a lot more need than what we typically had before because of the isolation. They became even more isolated than ever before. So we began reaching out to them on a weekly basis um, to see if they needed um, more resources. And again, if they didn't have anybody to get the groceries, we started working with area food banks and delivering and dropping off uh, food to their porch and things like that. So um, it all goes hand in hand. I don't think we can just do one part. It all has to come together if we really want our community to be healthy. Right. You know, I know you just talked about that a little bit, but, you know, what has the reaction really been among the people that are living in assisted living in the nursing homes? You know, depression, you know, has that been a huge factor? You know, what other types of, you know, I don't know what you would say, but, you know, characteristics or, you know, what have you seen, you know, among those patients? Sure. So I think sometimes, um, 
you know, everybody has different personalities. So let's say um, when some of my, my kids were born, maybe one of them was, you know, stubborn or um, had these different characteristics. And those are characteristics that are going to stay with anybody their whole life because it's just their personality. But I do think that there's different things that generations have. And what I will tell you that our seniors have, our senior generation has, is respect. Um, they have resilience. They have wisdom. And I think that although maybe in the beginning there was a lot of fear, um, I do think that they're a generation that we can learn a lot from. And they're a generation that is respectful to decisions. Even though they may not like them, they respect them. And I think that uh, they respect authority and leadership and they don't necessarily challenge it, but they do what they're told to do because that's how they were raised. And um, I also believe that if you want to hear stories or understand people who have been through adversity and really truly know how to live through it and you ask them, and I think that there's lots of wisdom right now that we can learn from them um, and know how to get through these difficult times. There was a moment that I had through this that I was, um, all of a sudden my grandmother came to mind and um, when she was on hospice care, um, she wanted a sandwich. And when she got done eating her sandwich, she had maybe one or two bites left. And she told me to wrap it up, she'd eat it later. Anybody in my generation, younger, and maybe even a little older, would have probably just thrown it away because it was one or two bites. She lived through the depression, and to her, you wrapped it up and you ate it later. And I think that this is a, a set of people who can know how to live simpler, know how to appreciate more with less, and I think we can learn a lot from them, especially now. And so I think personalities are something they're always going to just be with anybody. But I think that generationally we can learn a lot from them right now. Yeah. So with that, you know, what would you say is the best part about your job? Oh, gosh. Hands down, my team. Um, I'm actually a nurse. And so when I, I never thought I was going to go into management, leadership. I was, I was a bedside nurse. I was actually a hospice nurse. I loved it. Um, and I never saw myself in this role, but I struggled in the beginning um, getting away from patients. I didn't know how to make that transition. And eventually what I learned is if I treated my team like my patients, if I took care of them, if I assessed what their needs were, and I worked towards their goals, um, I could get them the outcomes. And so they quickly became equivalent to me caring for patients as me caring for my team. So they filled that need for me. And so um, hands down, it would be my team. I love them. I think if we can take care of our team and our company in-house, it starts to transition, then they take care of our patients. And so um, that's where I think it starts. So hands down, it's my team. Yeah, I've met some of them. They are really good people. Thank you, love them. Um, so I, th I think many people my age, just you know, have a very, I'd say like wrong understanding of, you know, what a nursing home and assisted living, you know, really does and really happens there. Uh, so, you know, when my teacher told us that we were going to Lake Vista last year. Uh, we had many people had very mixed emotions and, you know, things like that. But I, you know, I saw a great opportunity for us to really interact with that generation, as you said. And, you know, when I talked to, you know, Mr. Robert Thomas, uh, you know, what I learned was something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. And, you know, mm -hmm. you talked about it, how those connections that we can make and, you know, learn from that generation. It's something that, I think everyone should have the opportunity to do. Um, so, you know, with, with that, I used to wonder, do you think that when you move into a nursing home or assisted living, you know, that that, that, that could be like the last step or the last chance, you know, in, in someone's life? Um, 
I think that stigma is really starting to to go away. Mark and I laugh all the time. We said, you know, when the kids graduate, I think we're going to sell the house and get our villa on the lake because they have a lot of fun out there. I, I mean, they have so many groups and activities are constantly go. Um, and the way I would describe it is it's probably a lot like college when you have this uh, college town and you're with your peers and you're having a great time. Um, and that's really, it's a community. It's a community of your peers and um, they're doing things together um, that everybody enjoys. And the one thing, um, the My Independence program that we have out there is for those independent residents to remain independent. And it's important for them to do that. And we know that they're gonna age and they're gonna have needs as they age, um, but it's important for them to stay independent. And um, and they wanna age in place. So they, if they move into Lake Vista, they wanna stay there. They wanna stay amongst their friends um, and in an environment that's familiar. And so they may transition from the villa to the apartment building to the assisted living and then maybe the long-term care, but at least it's an environment that is familiar and it's staff that are familiar. And so um, I really wouldn't say it's kind of like giving up or the end. Um, and then a lot of times my team is able to come in and anchor onto that through home health or hospice care. And it's just really a huge family and it's a beautiful thing. And, um, but we, Mark and I laugh all the time because we just said, you know, how soon or what's the age requirement that we could just get out there because it'd just be a lot easier. Um, but, you know, they do, they have a great time. And I think you guys as students were surprised. I think you were gonna, you thought maybe you're gonna go in and, you know, push some people around in wheelchairs and, you know, feed people and sit at beds. And I think you were pleasantly surprised that it wasn't like that. And I will tell you the residents this day just still talk about it. It was one of the favorite things that they get to do is, is share their lives um, with you and hear about everything that you guys are doing now. So um, we love it. We love that opportunity that we have with you guys. Thank you. Um, you know, like you said, some people, you know, don't think it like that, but like spending the rest of your life there, as you said, that, you know, that's a gift to many people as you have many programs, you have mm -hmm. all these activities, you know, even for people that are, are, you know, not close to dying, but are, you know, just, just to be there, I guess you could say is something that even that I saw is, was a great experience. And I know those people, you know, are enjoying that and, and loving every minute of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You know, all those programs you guys have, bingo, you know, all those things that, that just really, you know, put a smile on those people's faces, you know, especially in times like these, you know, that they'll remember. Yep. And, that, and I think that's great. Thank you. So the last question I have for you is, you know, hearing about those hardships as some, as we talked about a little bit, like war or the depression, you know, hard family life or working jobs as a young teen, you know, how has your job impacted your life? Um, well, so how I got into what I'm doing is probably, I probably should start and explain that a little bit. I was, um, I, I started out in college going, my first decision in that was really based on um, softball. I had picked a school for that whole purpose. And um, when I got there, I realized I was going for a degree I really didn't want to do. I was in a location I didn't want to do. And when you're 18, a lot of times you're not, you don't know how to make that choice. And so I had to rethink it all. And um, I went back and I changed schools and I went back for nursing. I knew nursing was really what I wanted to do. And, um, but as I was finishing up my nursing um, degree, all of my friends knew exactly the area of nursing they wanted to do except for me. So then I started panicking again and I said, what am I going to do with this nursing degree? All my friends know what they want to do, but I don't. And um, Mark and I had gotten married. We did things maybe a less traditional way. And sometimes that was a lot harder, but I don't regret it at all. And 
he was raised with his grandparents a lot and they were very influential in his life. And we, um, I had the very um, fortunate experience to um, help his grandfather when he was on hospice care. It was my last year in nursing school. And that experience changed my life hands down. And during that time, um, it was very emotional, um, not much sleep, but there was a nurse who came in, her name was Ruth. And I said, I want to be Ruth someday. I knew that was exactly what I wanted to do. And we had a conversation about two o'clock in the morning, his grandpa and I he said, kiddo, you're gonna be one heck of a nurse someday. And I don't know whether or not I did or didn't, but that just, that moment stuck with me. And when I first graduated, I went into the ICU and then there was a job opening in hospice. And as I was interviewing for this job, um, the door opened and a nurse walked in and it was Ruth. And she goes, I know you. And I said, I know you too. And needless to say, I got the job and I kind of felt like it was divine. But ever since that moment, it was, it, it has really been that experience with um, his grandfather and it, every patient, every, that we care for, um, you know, I know what it's been like to be that family member. I know what it's been like to be that nurse. I know what it's been like, um, to be an administrator of it. I know what it's, it's like to run it. So, um, I try to take myself into each experience and, and he's really a catalyst for, for all of that. And, um, and I'm thankful to, for that time. Um, and every patient to me is, is in his memory. And so um, I've also had my grandmother on care and been able to set up a program kind of in memory of her. And so I want families to have that same opportunity. And so I would say um, those things are what shaped me. Those things continue to shape me hearing other people's stories, being able to be with them, that really is what, um, you know, I think it's all about. And I just, we get one chance to do it right. And um, I want my team to be able to uh, do what, it, what they can to help people. It's really a privilege um, and an honor to be invited at that time uh, with families. And, um, you know, it's a very sacred time. and. Um, you know, that's what we want to do is we're not here to take over, but we're just here to help and uh, serve. And so I think that um, that's the, the blessing is that I get to be with those families in, in the same way that somebody was able to do it for me. Right. You know, how, you know, would you say that the faith part of, you know, your, you know, the aspect of that has really helped you? And, you know, helping, you know, your patients or, you know, your, you know, people in the nursing home and, you know, how, you know, like I said, how has that helped you and, and them? Um, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, not every decision is easy. Um, I try to tell myself a lot of times when I'm making a decision, what would Christ do and, and stick with that. Um, you know, not every decision I make people are going to like, um, but I really try to hold on to that and hold on to those values. Um, you know, we're here to love people, serve people. Um, and I think when we realize that we were all created in his image, we are taught that we're not given every trait of, of Christ, but we're given something. And when we use that piece to serve, um, amazing things can happen and we don't have to be famous. We don't have to give a million dollars. We just have to give that little bit to somebody else and make um, somebody or, or the place better than when we left it. And I think when you continue to just do that on a daily basis, um, your life becomes more fulfilling and those around you do too. And that's what I think God asked of us to do. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of similarities probably um, through uh, Ohio Living and JFK. Um, you guys are really called to serve your community and God. And um, we have a lot of those same uh, faith-based um, uh, values. 
And I think that that's how our connection through the intergenerational project and the letter writing began is because um, I think it's a very connected uh, mindset uh, through Christ. Right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. You and all your staff are the heroes of today. And I know thank you. This. Thank you. You're an amazing individual. You just keep doing what you're doing, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Proud of you. I said I'll hello. I, I will. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody, for watching my third episode of Hometown Heroes. In honor of the intergenerational project and all the projects that will be influenced by, you know, I hope that are influenced by, you know, our school, you know, interacting with the later generations. Here is a commemorative video of my time spending with Robert Thomas and all the, st all the patients at Ohio Living Lake Vista. See you next time.